Hi, this is Rob Ross Russell. I am a Director of Studies in Medicine at Peterhouse in Cambridge and I'm uh, revisiting uh, some mock interviews we did a few years ago with uh, Q&J and Drew Val, who is a second year student, has very kindly uh, agreed to come in and, and act the uh, interviewee so that we can uh, run through some questions and see how it goes. So uh, without any further ado, I shall launch into what might be representative of part of an interview. So, um, Drew Val, welcome. Uh, I'm Dr. Ross Russell. I'm the Director of Studies in Medicine uh, nice here at Peter's. You. Nice to meet you. Um, have you come from far today? I've come from Peter, actually, so not too far. Not too far, so it was a fairly easy trip. Yeah. Okay. So we've got about half an hour of your time. We're going to ask you some general questions, but then we'll, we'll push into some fairly specific questions uh, to test you a little bit, uh, and then uh, we'll be uh, free to go after that. Sounds okay. good. All right. Now, in your um, personal statement, you talked about your work experience, which I think was in Peterborough, wasn't it? Tell me yeah. a bit about that. Yeah, so I got to follow an ear, nose and throat surgeon around for a day, and it was just a really eye-opening experience, seeing the range of things they do, the way they talk to patients. I know there was one example where a woman was getting stitches to like severe burns on her face, and it was just really inspiring to see the way they come, like, talk to her, how they were really passionate about doing a good job, how they talked to her husband, made her feel really comfortable in quite a difficult situation. Okay, so communication was was, was a key thing. Skill, what, uh, what excited you about the work itself? I think the way they worked together as a team was really what was interesting for me. So um, it wasn't just one person doing the job, it was a team of three people, kind of really good friends actually, it seemed like, working together. Um, you go and fetch those tools, you go and I'll do the stitches, I'll fetch the aftercare, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's really good. That's really good. Okay. So we're going to just uh, start some, some fairly straightforward questions. Have you done biology in your A-levels? I have. Yeah. You have. Okay, so have you done the kidney in biology? Uh, we've just finished that, actually. Yes. Excellent. Good. So tell me a little bit about how the kidney works. What does it do? Uh, so the kidney filters blood, so it removes waste, um, which gets removed as urine, and it sort of detoxifies the blood. Okay. So... Stuff goes through the kidney, it's filtered through. Kidney do anything to it once it's in the in, inside the kidney? I think the kidney takes all of the um, minerals and nutrients out of the blood and then reabsorbs the things that you want to keep in your body and it um, gets rid of the things that you want to lose. Okay. So th there's some processes going on in the kidney in terms of stuff going in and out. Uh, okay. One of the problems we might have is we might want to measure how much blood is going through the kidneys. We might want to measure renal blood flow. Mm. How might we go about that? How might we measure? We know what, how, what would we do to measure renal blood flow? Um, I think you'd want something that's non-invasive to begin with, okay. so you can measure it easily. And the first thing that comes to mind is the urine. So okay. maybe you could measure something that's in the urine, um, a component that gets filtered out of the kidney, and then do some kind of calculation to measure blood flow. Okay, so, so we've got a urine flow, you're absolutely right, and we want something to come out and, and measure it. Think through with me what characteristics you'd have to have. So sugar, for example, comes out of the urine. Would that be a good thing to test in the, in the, in the urine? Would it not be good? Because that could vary depending on what you've just eaten. If you've just had a meal, that could be okay. more urine, yeah. sugar. And, and do we normally find sugar in the urine when we pee it out? No, I don't if, think you're no, supposed we to. Don't. No, unless you've got diabetes. So if we're in a normal situation, the little bit, what happens to the bit of sugar that gets into the kidneys? Is it reabsorbed? It, it's reabsorbed, so it's, it's taken up along with amino acids and things like that. Okay, so, so if we were choosing to measure something in the urine, like amino acids or sugar, that wouldn't be any good. So what do we need to know about what it is that we're measuring? Does it need to be something that's completely filtered out of the blood into the urine so it doesn't get reabsorbed? Okay, so there's two things in there. Just tease those out a bit for me. You, you said filtered out of the blood and into the urine and doesn't get reabsorbed. Talk me through those bits. So for the first thing about it being filtered out of the blood, um, it would be something that is in the blood when it enters the kidney and then is no longer in the blood leaving the kidney. So you know that okay. it's all been taken out in the urine. So do you think is that what normally happens? If I put a substance in your body, in your blood, that was going to be filtered by the kidney, would it normally all come out in the kidney? No, I think you could get some part of it out, but you couldn't achieve okay. all of it being okay. removed. 
So, and if you took out part of it, is that a bit of a problem? Yeah, because you don't know how much of it has actually been removed. So what might you need to do with this substance? Um, could you also measure its concentration in the blood? Yep. And then I guess you could put those two together somehow by the blood flow. Okay, so, and, and it's exactly, we, we do a very, very similar thing. We dilute uh, something called inulin and we look at that uh, as it comes out in the urine. That's very, very good. Well done. Okay, completely different. I'm going to show you a graph here. This is in a book called The Spirit Level, and this is a graph. Have a look at it for a moment, and then uh, I'd like you to just comment on what you get from that graph. So it's a graph showing infant mortality rates um, in single mothers. Um, so infant deaths per thousand of the population, and it's comparing England and Wales to Sweden. I can see that the one clear trend that's really obvious is that deaths are higher in England and Wales than Sweden for every um, data point that's recorded. Yep. And there's another trend which is that as social class increases from low to high, so this is the father's social class, the infant mortality decreases. Okay. Okay. So what inferences would you make from that? So for the first trend, I'd say that there could be an inference that perhaps infant healthcare is better in Sweden than in England and Wales, which is causing there to be less deaths. And with increasing social class, maybe you could infer that that comes with additional benefits, such as increased access to healthcare, which decreases in mortality as well. Okay. Um, all of the figures are above those of Sweden in every category, aren't they? Okay. So if I charged you with, in the Ministry of Health, with sorting out our lousy infant mortality rate with single mums, particularly in poor social classes, what might you want to do about that? Well, you know that it's the situation is better in Sweden, so I guess you could see what Sweden's doing differently. So perhaps there's more support given to single mothers from the government in terms of benefits. Okay. Okay, so you might want a nice trip to Sweden to see what's going on over there, yeah. Anything you want to tell me about the variability with social class in Sweden? Oh, that's actually a third trend that I hadn't noticed. So it's a lot, lot less variable than in England and Wales. So actually, some of the higher social classes in Sweden have greater infant mortality than the lower social classes. So there's much more evenness, isn't there? So why might that be? It could be that the healthcare system is different in Sweden. Um, so it could be that everyone gets the same level of treatment, regardless of social class, if it's not based on money, for example. Okay. Yeah. Well, quite interesting. The, 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 the book goes on to, to look a lot about social equality and, and uh, how that impacts on, on health in a variety of ways. Very interesting. If you wanted to develop a research project to test you've, you've found a new way of doing things a, a new way of funding or a new medication or something to, to deal with so let's talk about funding so you you think that this scheme would work how might you go about setting up your research project so is the question how would i do some research to find out how we can allocate funding differently yes i suppose i was and, and i'm not not sure whether we can extend it with this particular example that far um but how would you, let, let's take a slightly different example, which would be a bit easier. Let's, let's just talk very simply about uh, a research. If you found a new medication rather than uh, a complicated sort of funding issue, you found new medication, you want to trial it out uh, in a group of patients. How are you going to design your study? So I would first of all choose my population that I'm going to give the medicine to. So okay. I'd want to make sure that it's a fair representation of the population who would be given the medicine. Okay. So lots of diverse backgrounds of people, maybe age groups. Um, and I would begin with low doses of the medication in case it's harmful. Okay. So how many people do you want? Uh, as many as possible. Okay, because? Because the more people you have, the less chance there is of random error. Okay. What might make a difference to the number of people you have? Let's say you had a rare disease that quite difficult to get thousands of people off because there aren't that many people with this condition. How are you going to get around that? So you would start off with the people that you can get. Okay. Um, and then if you think that your results 
probably have been affected by error. Then you could perhaps look at similar diseases, or you could, I guess you could use computer modelling somehow. Well, you can, in some cases, use animal modelling, or, or uh, if, if that's appropriate, some computer modelling. What might influence the number of people you need to have in a study before you can get results? Is it the... So, could it be that the number of people who will be affected by the drug once it's released? Um, so if millions of people are going to be taking the drug, you want to make sure you've got a large sample size. Well, no, I suppose it's like, I, I'm going at a slightly different angle. What, when, when do, what is the description we give to a study that shows a positive result? What do we call it? We say that it was... Successful? <laughs> yes, I suppose we do, yes. Yeah, we, but we, we say it's statistically significant. Oh, do you right. know what that means? What, yeah. what, what's that mean? So it means that Usually. you've done a statistical test on it, which shows that it's beyond the threshold for being a significant to result. Which, yeah, which is usually at around what percentage? Um, 90%? Yes, often 95. So we often okay. say 95, but some people, in some situations, you talk about a 90% significant. So you can say it is statistically significant at the 5% level would be the way of okay. describing it. If it means that it's 95% likely to be due to an effect and 5% due to chance. So that's a 95% uh, chance. So if I was, I might be able to do a study on 20 people in one group and 20 in another and show a statistically significant difference. Mm. When is that likely to happen compared with when I might need 100 people? If the drug actually is very um, significant in its effect, yes. then you'd get a lot stronger results, even the, with less people. If the magnitude of the change is such that you can you can pull that out uh, yeah. rapidly. So the size of the difference is quite an important mm -hmm. factor, and choosing that is uh, quite a, a, an interesting one. Okay. Last question on the current um, uh, patch. Again, completely different. Uh, a lady is brought to you in the emergency department she's 28 and she's got learning disability and she's brought in by her mum so she's struggles to communicate and it looks as though she's got a lot of abdominal pain and you think she's got appendicitis what are the issues there in terms of taking her to theatre and getting consent from her so she's struggling to communicate um which means that i probably can't get consent from her in time for the operation because I think appendicitis is quite serious so I need to take urgent action but okay. at the same time it's important to get consent before I can do any sort of operation and do an intervention so it might be figuring out why she's unable to communicate is it a language barrier can I get a translator in good is she just nervous scared of being in a hospital what can I do to calm her down that kind of thing yeah good I think all of those are, are good things what sorts of things might you be able to do with her to help that communication? It could be that she's been brought in and there's lots of people around her. Okay. So maybe I could sort of close off a room, maybe. Um, Just you and her? Well, I'd need more people present, I think. So who? Um, could it be the people who would be doing the surgery? So she's aware, she's met the people who will be operating on her. Okay, so it's important if you're taking consent that you have a full understanding of the processes and the risks involved. So you need to either have surgical experience or knowledge of the procedure before you could give take consent anyway. What about her mum? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want her mum present. Okay. Yeah. I want her mum present too. Okay, so she might be able to help with the uh, communication. Mm -hmm. If you're still struggling, what proceed, what what can you do next? Do we just take her to the theatre? Do we? So I think depending on the age of the child. Well, 28, so no uh, longer a child. Yeah. Um, I don't think you could ethically take her to theatre without her consent. So you would have to find a way around that before you did anything. So who gives consent for children? They, I can't get consent from a seven-year-old. Their Not parents. Meaning person. Okay. So what about in this situation? So could you use the concept of capacity? So yes. perhaps she's not in a position to give consent because of some other factor, like yeah. intoxication, for example. Yeah. Yeah. 
um, if he could prove that, then he could. Um, is it called a scene consent? Like, if it's something that's going to save her life, then. Yes. Well, first of all, it, 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 you you can do it without consent if if it is you know it is life threatening and legally is immediate, but very often. Uh, Adult patients who don't have the capacity consent will have consent. Have the, you know, the, the parent will have the uh, authority to give oh, consent yeah. for them. So okay. it may well be that this mother has uh, the capacity to give consent for her daughter already. Okay. You know, enshrined uh, uh, by uh, the fact that this is the, she is the carer and that is the situation. Okay. She is the the uh, legal guardian and uh, and so can look after her. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Well done, and uh, we look forward to uh, letting you know the results uh, beginning of January. Thank you very much.